so yeah, I want to talk about God's uh, common grace and the theological praxis of counseling. Uh, why? Because for many inevitable reasons, like getting licensed, many Christian counselors will deliver mental health services to unbelievers. And someone actually asked one of my colleagues, are you just making people happy on the way to hell? So his question really makes Christian counselors ask themselves the question, is counseling unbelievers a moral dilemma for Christian counselors? Or I would like to suggest a front row seat to God's common grace. So uh, to respond to this question, I'd like to discuss the reformer's definition of common grace, the biblical basis of God's compassion for all of his creation, reform perspectives on viable occupations for Christians, and the theological praxis of counseling. So how did uh, the reformers at least conceptualize common grace? Well, Louis Burkhoff notes that Luther believed that fallen man is by nature capable, actually, of doing much that is good and praiseworthy in the lower and earthly sphere, though he's utterly incapable of doing any spiritual good. Calvin, though, differed from Luther, right? He firmly maintained that the natural man can of himself do no good work whatsoever and developed alongside the doctrine of particular grace, the doctrine of common grace. So what is that? Uh, Burkhoff clarifies that common grace does not um, pardon nor purify human nature. It curbs the destructive power of sin, as Dennis was mentioning earlier, maintains in a measure the moral order of the universe, thus making an orderly life possible, distributes in varying degrees gifts and talents among men, promotes the development of science and art, and showers untold blessings upon the children of men. And in the Institutes, this is a kind of a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, in the Institutes, Calvin writes, in reading profane authors, the admirable light of truth displayed in them should remind us that the human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still adorned and invested with admirable gifts from its creator. And he adds, God, by his providence, curbs the perverseness of nature, preventing it from breaking forth into action, yet without rendering it inwardly pure. And then the uh, Synod of Dortrecht in 1618 makes clear that while this common grace allows humans to retain some knowledge of God or natural things and of the difference between good and evil and shows some regard for virtue and for good outward behavior, it is not saving grace. Uh, further, in 1924, the Christian Reformed Churches Synod issued an official declaration on the subject of common grace, insisting that there is indeed a kind of non-salvific attitude of divine favor towards all human beings, manifested in three ways. One, the bestowal of natural gifts, such as rain and sunshine, upon creatures in general. The restraining of sin and human affairs so that the unredeemed do not produce all of the evil that their depraved natures might otherwise bring about. And three, the ability of unbelievers to perform acts of civic good. So, uh, Luis Berka. Uh, so, Luis Berkoff clarifies the difference between common grace and special saving grace. And I'll just read B, the second one. So special grace removes the guilt and penalty of sin, changes the inner life, and gradually cleanses an elect person from the pollution of sin, whereas common grace never does this, but only has a restraining effect on the corrupting influence of sin and mitigates its results. So from a reform perspective, both the doctrine of total depravity and common grace coexist. And Richard Mao cautions that common grace is not an across the board upgrading of our fall, original fallen state, but instead restrains the ruin that would naturally come from human sinfulness. So one last important aspect, I think, of common grace, though, is that it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So when speaking of common grace, uh, Burkhoff has this in mind, those general operations of the Holy Spirit whereby he, without renewing the heart, exercises such a moral influence on man through his general or special revelation 
that sin is restrained, order is maintained in social life, and civil righteousness is promoted. And in my thinking, this fits with the work of my colleague, Dr. John Jefferson Davis, who notes that the Holy Spirit is active at several levels, and I'm gonna illustrate these levels in a counseling context. So at the extraordinary supernatural level, we might see or notice the Spirit's extraordinary miraculous cure of an addiction. At the ordinary supernatural level, we might notice the Spirit's healing over time of behavioral patterns. At the natural level, we might notice just the God-created natural healing process of talking, through my, of talking through problems. So my working definition of common grace, borrowing largely from what I've presented earlier, is common grace is the work of God the Holy Spirit in curbing the destructive power of sin, maintaining the moral order of the universe, making an orderly life possible, distributing gifts and talents to people, promoting the development of science and art, and showering untold blessings upon all people indiscriminately. And it is not saving grace. So the, while common grace does encompass this notion that unbelieving people gifted by God speak truth and justice and make orderly life and science and art possible, it also encompasses this notion of indiscriminate untold blessings. It's not surprising that the reformers included this notion in their understanding of common grace because this aspect of common grace flows from God's essential character of goodness and compassion as he relates to all of his creation, not just the covenant community. So this is made clear in Psalm 145. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And so what will strike the careful readers of scripture is that God, in fact, is the one who makes people happy on the way to hell. He apparently bestows common grace gifts to people who are under the sentence of death. And so Burkhoff writes, cannot God have compassion even on the condemned sinner and bestow favors upon him? The answer need not be uncertain, since the Bible clearly teaches that he showers untold blessings upon all men and also clearly indicates that uh, these are the expression of a favorable disp disposition in God, which falls short, however, of the positive volition to pardon their sin, to lift their sentence, and to grant them salvation. And as I said, this is clear throughout the Bible. So in Psalm 104, we read, he makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. In Psalm 145, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. In Jonah 4, and should, not, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. Uh, in Ezekiel 18, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. In Matthew 5, he causes his rain to, sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. In Luke 6, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. In Galatians 6, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So Richard Mao argues that the reason God does good to all people and asks us to do good to all people is that God is not only interested in doing good so that people will ultimately come to him or because he can't help blessing the non-elect as he blesses the elect, but because he cares for more than people's eternal destinies. And he writes, the underlying view I'm endorsing here posits multiple divine purposes in the world. To state it plainly, I'm insisting that as God unfolds his plan for his creation, he is interested in more than one thing, 
Alongside God's clear concern about the eternal destiny of individuals are his designs for the larger creation. And part of Mao's statement is based in his infralapsarian perspective where first God decided to create the world, then God decided to permit the fall, and only after these decrees did the divine decision occur with regard to election and reprobation. Thus, God's electing and reprobating purposes were subordinate to or infra the decision to create a world that would come to be plagued by sin. So Mao goes on uh, to argue that it's quite fitting for us also to feature a similar multiplicity in our theologies. So our theology must feature God's goodness and compassion, which result in untold indiscriminate blessings which spotlight his positive disposition toward the well-being of his creatures and the relief of their suffering. So as Mao states, uh, we ought actively to promote the joy and hope and to diminish the grief and anguish of our fellow human beings regardless of their election and reprobation. And one of the ways believers do this is to seek the shalom or the well-being of the people around us. So in Jeremiah 29, the exiles are told to seek the shalom of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it has shalom, you too will have shalom. Shalom is translated peace or prosperity or welfare. We are, we are to seek the shalom of the whole city, even the shalom of unbelievers, because shalom curbs the destructive power of sin and makes an orderly life possible. So where God gives shalom and where people seek shalom, there's peace and prosperity, there's safety, there's healing and good relationships. God is also positively disposed to relieving the suffering of his creatures. So for example, in Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 lepers. And as Mao points out, we must face up to a few stubborn and massive facts. Only one of 10 lepers came to faith. Jesus healed all of them. So relief of the suffering of his creatures was a sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And Pennington explains that in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is not only from heaven, but it is also heavenly, radically different from all earthly kingdoms and will replace them on the earth. Jesus proclaimed his kingdom of God by feeding and healing. Jesus sent out his disciples to do the same. And Mao adds, if God's deep love for humanity persists, even despite the effects of sin, then the theology of common grace is an important resource for our efforts as Christians to respect and reflect that love. And Jesus told his disciples and us uh, in Matthew 10, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. In Luke 9, 2, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In Luke 9, 6, so they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now, I am not suggesting that Christians are ushering in God's kingdom onto earth by helping people for, heal from their disorders. Our, dis, our citizenship will always be in heaven. But alleviating human suffering is part of the proclamation of the kingdom of God. And the early church apparently understood this because it was focused on alleviating human suffering. It was Christians who stayed in the cities to care for the sick in the Antonine Plague and in the Plague of Cyprian. And the bishop Dionysius of Corinth said on Easter Sunday, 260 AD, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. This focus on alleviating human suffering wasn't just limited to caring for the sick. Tertullian wrote, everyone puts a little to the public stock and all of these collections are deposited in a common bank for charitable uses for feeding the poor, burying the dead, providing for girls and boys who have neither parents nor provisions left to support them, for relieving old people worn out in the service of the saints, 
or for those who have suffered by shipwreck or are condemned to the mines or islands or prisons and only for the faith of Christ. So we could give many examples of alleviating suffering throughout the Christian era, but one powerful example for me is the missionaries in the 19th and 20th centuries who brought not just the gospel, but also medical care, education, and orphanages to the world. And their aim was not only to restore the wholeness violated by sin uh, or disease, but to preserve it, ensuring that so far as human science can assist the action of the grace of God, preventable ills shall be prevented. Uh, medical missionaries were motivated by the belief that all people had a sacred right to life temporal and life eternal and to conditions of life, if not a little lower than those of angels, at least a little higher than those of beasts of the field. And in many, many of the missionaries' minds, there grew up the conviction that physical efforts could not be isolated from mental and spiritual causes, but that cause and effect, ignorance and suffering, sin and pain were so closely knotted together that no single approach would ever be sufficient. So in summary, within the reformed notion of common grace, God blesses indiscriminately all of his creatures. In the Old Testament, we read that the exiles sought the shalom or the well-being of their city. And in the New Testament, we read that Jesus healed and fed as an evidence of the inbreaking of God's kingdom. The church throughout the ages has understood this common grace to include alleviating human suffering. But there's one more aspect to the reformers' notion of common grace, and that is the perspectives on viable occupations for Christians. So my brother worked at L'Arche at Cuis la Motte, founded by Jean Vanier, dedicated to living in community with people with intellectual disabilities. He basically lived in a community with folks who could not understand or accept the gospel. So was my brother's ministry of common grace a viable occupation for a Christian, given that it was not focused on the salvation of the severely disabled? So Luther was key, obviously, in breaking down the distinctions between clergy and laity and laying the foundation for what would become the Protestant work ethic, the belief that lawful uh, vocations were means to serve God. But would counseling unbelievers be a viable occupation? So Richard Mao gives this example. Take the case of a Christian therapist counseling a non-believer couple whose marriage has been seriously wounded by the husband's adulterous affair. The therapist helps them to be honest about the hurts and fears and angers that have surrounded the infidelity. Finally, a moment comes when the husband tearfully acknowledges the pain he has caused and asks his wife to forgive him. She reaches out with a newfound tenderness toward him. They embrace both of them sobbing. It is clear that they intend to build a new life together. They have not been saved in the process, but the therapist is convinced that she has witnessed and has been privileged to be a human instrument in a powerful display of healing grace. She senses that she has reinforced the kinds of behaviors and attitudes that God wants for human beings. So from my vantage point, the Christian counselor was administering God's common grace to this couple, helping to curb the destructive power of sin, the sin of adultery in a broken relationship, helping to maintain the moral order of a marriage covenant, making an orderly life possible because stable marriages are the cornerstone of a stable society, and administering the precious blessing of God's shalom on this couple and participating with the healing work of the Holy Spirit. But there's more. So going back to our definition of common grace, the reformers also noted that God distributes gifts and talents to people promoting the development of science and art. The Christian counselor is not just salt and light for that couple, but is also salt and light within the occupation of counseling. As Dr. Christopher Cook from our Charlotte campus has said, there's a vital need for counselors who are informed with sound theology to shape the counseling profession and in turn society. Christians are needed to preserve what is good about counseling, the science that God in his common grace has allowed to develop and society as a result. So within this re reform perspective, we find the emphasis in neo-Calvinists like Kuiper and classical Calvinists like Van Drunen. So Abraham Kuiper emphasizes the work of God's common grace in superintending non-believers' discovery of God's truth through science. God himself developed his own divine plan for this construction, created the geniuses and talents for implementing that plan, and directed the labor of everyone and made them fruitful so that what he wanted and still wants would indeed become reality. 
And he continues, we indeed, we need to understand on the one hand the darkening of our understanding by sin, and on the other hand, God's common grace that has placed a limitation on this darkening. But Kuiper suggests that the darkening is that unbelievers do not apprehend the deep meaning of science. He writes, sin's darkening lies in this, that we lost the gift of grasping the true context, the proper coherence, the systematic integration of all things. And this reminds me of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round it and pluck blackberries. And it, it takes Christians to see that blackberries are evidence of God's magnificent work of cre creation and that counseling is an evidence of God's intentional blessing of all of his creatures and his superintending of the discovery and development of the science of counseling as one means of alleviating human suffering to which he seems to be positively disposed. So Van Drunen argues that from Luther's vantage, as, as Dennis was uh, talking about, that uh, Christians live in two kingdoms. He writes, Christians rejoice to be citizens of heaven through membership in the church, but also recognize that for the time being, they are living in Babylon, striving for justice and excellence in their cultural labors out of love for Christ and their neighbor as sojourners and exiles in a land that is not their lasting home. He's adamant that believers can be in any lawful occupation as part of this Babylonian kingdom. And he writes this two kingdoms doctrine strongly affirms that God has made all things, that sin corrupts all aspects of life, that Christians should be active in human culture, that all lawful cultural vocations are honorable, that all people are accountable to God in every activity, and that Christians should seek to live out the implications of their faith in their daily vocations. So he also emphasizes that our work in the common kingdom will necessarily be done with unbelievers. He writes, Christians are not summoned to withdraw into their own cultural ghettos, but their cultural activities are intertwined with those of the world at large. And he gives the example of Daniel and his friends who became Babylonian political officials. He also emphasizes Paul's message in Corinthians. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. So Van Drunen rejects the notion that working with unbelievers is just to evangelize them. He also specifies that, that though our work is not eternal, it is important work. So he writes many recent books on Christianity and culture, target sayings such as, you don't polish the brass on a sinking ship, which some people use to denigrate cultural work based upon the idea that it's all about to be destroyed anyway. Such sayings are indeed unhelpful and misleading. Our cultural products themselves are not meant to endure into the world to come. They belong to the stuff of the present world. Contrary to what some people suggest, we are to spend time on things that do not last. We are like the Israelite exiles who built homes and planted gardens in Babylon, though they knew they would leave there after 70 years. So uh, in summary, and sorry, I only realized last night that those two guys are smoking. I hope that's not offensive. But uh, in summary, all lawful work is a means to serve God, and cultural endeavors like science are evidences of God's common grace. Laboring in the realm of counseling is honorable and will likely be done with unbelievers. And in this work, Christian counselors are accountable to God as they critically engage with the cultural endeavor of counseling. So the theological basis for praxis as a Christian counselor working with an unbeliever is common grace. When I counsel a depressed unbeliever, I'm participating in God's intentional pouring out of his grace on all of his creatures indiscriminately. I'm working to alleviate human suffering. I'm seeking the shalom of my city. I'm demonstrating what the kingdom of God looks like. I'm participating with God to curb the effects of sin because depression results in broken relationships, occupational difficulties, and sometimes the devastation of suicide.
I'm helping to maintain the moral order by preventing the depression from developing into substance abuse, which might result in crimes like selling drugs. I'm making an orderly life possible when the depressed person returns to work and re reconnects with family. I'm using the gifts that God has given me and promoting the science. Of course, as Mao points out, the vulnerability of infralapsarians, those who assert that God showers his grace on his whole kingdom, his whole creation, is that we can end up with a limp-wristed theology that appropriates psychological themes in order to cater to the needs of a generation of self-actualizers. And in order for the concept of common grace to not devolve into a 21st century psychological love fest, we do need boundaries. Going back to our definition, common grace is not about self-actualization. It's other focus, not self-focus. It's also not about me. It's God's common grace with which I participate to help others experience the indiscriminate untold blessings of God. I'm dependent on God's grace and accountable to him, and I engage my culture critically. But in the theology of common grace, the reformers have given us a basis for explaining what we all see, that the world is not as evil as it could be, a basis for the practice of counseling, and a basis also for praising God for his great and unexplainable love, compassion, and goodness, which he graciously showers on all of his creation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Karen, if you could just stay there for a couple of minutes. Any question? I just have one quick comment. Uh, I'm from the Harvard campus, the Harvard Ivy Research Institute. I very much appreciate your visual, you know, PowerPoint slide, enhance memory and learning. And also, I very much appreciate your theocentric and for your practice, you know, counseling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. I do have the questions related to this. Um, we, we serve some ch uh, Chinese students in Northeastern, and uh, sometimes they will pray for the uh, TOEFL exam, or maybe, um, so a student just had an interview two days ago, uh, for a co-op, and some ask for uh, ask us to pray for the result of the midterm which he has already taken. Oh, so th there are a lot of things for the for these um, they are not believers. Um, I sometimes have do, do have struggle. Uh, I don't know how to how to pray sometimes. So. Um, Sometimes I just don't have that fulfilling sometimes to, to pray for the, the common grace for them at the same time because they, they refuse the, um, the special grace. So how to overcome? I, I, I know probably theolo theologically what you present is, is right, but actually how to, I mean from my, my heart, I just have struggled to do it. And, and so, uh, just to be clear, your question is, how do I pray for non-Christians, say, to pass their TOEFL test? No. How to actually uh, execute what you have presented, actually? Um, that's a big, a, a big question. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I do have to say, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question, but I'll answer it a, a little bit around the back door here. I have to say, one of the things that really struck me in doing all the reading for this, uh, I still don't have an answer for why God cares so deeply about absolutely everybody. Um, so I, I, that, that's still kind of a question for me. I feel like I, I take that by faith. You know, I read it in the Bible and I take it by faith that God really cares about, his, about the people that he's created, the people on this earth. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I, I'm not exactly sure why, though. <laughs> 